I'm not fluent yet. So Giuseppe asked me not to present a paper, said that I should do something different, uh, papers during dinner, but that's not dinner anyways, uh, so, uh, are boring, <clears throat> and especially after two days of presentation, uh, it would be too much. So it said, do something a la Parisi, funny. Okay, and then he's also adding that it would be published in the journal, so it should be publishable. I think it's an old set. Uh, so, um, and then to make things worse, Avram asked for a title. Um, and so I came up with this title that makes no sense. Uh, <clears throat> then I tried to make some sense of the nonsensible title. Uh, and you know, one way to make sense of this is that you probably all ask what is the financial award for this prize? <laughs> and it depends on your age and your life expectancy. Because along with the Lifetime Achievement Award, there is a honorary membership to the association, which means you don't have to pay for the membership fee every year. Uh, so we have to figure out a way to grow younger so the value grows with time. Um, and the other reason is that by writing a nonsensical uh, title to something that will be published, SSRN downloads will go higher. People will download to figure out what, what's going on here. Um, and then, you know, as I was coming up with stories here, I came up with other reasons for the title. Um, so I am particularly happy to receive this award here in Israel. Uh, some of you know uh, privately that um, I am the last one in, in a lineage of maternal. Uh, my grand-grandmother uh, was a Espinosa, uh, and so I am the last from a grandmother line of to be entitled to an Israeli passport. No, I, I, think, I, I think my children may still get it. Uh, so I am happy to be here. Uh, and additionally, I have a great friendship with uh, Ariel Porat. We wrote together. Uh, and I'm so happy that he has become president of the uh, University of Tel Aviv. So congratulations to him. Maybe. He's, no He's totally justified. Uh, so I, I, had, I used to come here quite often. My, one of my earliest conferences was in uh, uh, Haifa, uh, and Tel Aviv has become more and more beautiful. Uh, I remember in Haifa that year there were two mayors present at the conference. There, were, there was the mayor of Haifa, the mayor of Jerusalem, and I heard the best line ever, the two of them, they came to a compromise saying that Jerusalem was the most beautiful city in the world and Haifa was the most beautiful city in Israel. Uh, and I'm sure that if the mayor of Tel Aviv was around and is around, he could come up with a way to put Tel Aviv on the podium uh, as something, <laughs> as a winner as well. Uh, so I wish I could tell you a better story. So I don't have a paper. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the story. Uh, so the, um, I have three slides. Um, that's the good news, but the bad news is that there is no dinner coming. Uh, <laughs> I don't see anything. Maybe some wine? Uh, the wine is there. Um, <laughs> um, something about how I came up uh, to law and economics, and it's a, it's a series of fortunate accidents. Uh, they're all accidents. Uh, I'm Italian, Italians are always late. Uh, I came to the United States after law school. Uh, I had a full bride to do a JSD in legal history of all things. Uh, and it was my last semester 
uh, and I was one week late for class. Uh, I stayed a little longer for uh, winter break. And I was also 15 minutes late for class. <clears throat> and there was a change in class, in room assignment, so I even walked into the brown class. And at the point I was too embarrassed to walk out, so I stayed there pretending to be one of the students of that class. And oh my god, I almost thought I was in the wrong department. Um, it was actually uh, a class that uh, Daniel Rubinfeld was co-teaching with uh, uh, Steve Sugarman. The class was titled Tor Theory and Policy. Uh, um, Rubinfeld was at the blackboard writing down uh, Chavel's 1980 model of tort law, equations. Never seen equations in a law school, I had no idea. Uh, I was supposed to be in, in a jurisprudence course, legal philosophy. So, all oh, over. Oh. Um, but I kind of was intrigued. My mom was a mathematician, my father was a judge on the Italian Supreme Court, so I had split loyalties. I actually liked mathematics quite a bit. So I stayed for the class. Um, I realized that actually it was a law class. Um, and eventually I thought, oh, this is actually something I might like to take. So I went to my JSD supervisor, his name was uh, James Godley, he was a comparative law legal historian person. And he said, this is my last semester, I'm supposed to be in a jurisprudence course, uh, but I stumbled into this class, which overlaps in time. Would it be okay if I changed? Uh, it's already two weeks into the class, I have already missed two classes, or the other one anyways. Um, and he said, you know, go, do what you like, you know, it's your last semester. Um, and so I did. Uh, <clears throat> I loved that class. Um, and that class was too much and too little uh, for me. Uh, it was too much because it irreversibly changed my way of thinking. It was too hard to go back to dogmatic way of thinking of law. Too little because I didn't have the foundations to really work in the field. So I, at the point I was finishing my Fulbright, I was finishing my JSD, um, and my advisor said, you know, if you're really interested in this field, you should talk to the person here at the law school that um, is the, you know, the, the, you know, the coordinator of this, his name is Robert Cooter. So I went and introduced myself to Robert Cooter. Um, and he said, well, yes, one course is not enough to be a player, to, to be, uh, um, if you really want to teach in this field, you may have to take some technical courses. Uh, would you be willing to invest in this? Uh, so by that time, I had just been um, hired by um, the University of Rome, La Sapienza, as an assistant professor of private law in the Department of political science. Uh, Italian jobs of that kind are hard to come about, especially for people of my age at that time. Uh, <clears throat> so I went back to get a job uh, and I told my parents, you know, I found mathematics used in law school. Uh, my mom was laughing. Uh, <laughs> but my father kind of understood um, my dilemma. And he told me that he had a great career. He was in the Supreme Court, he served on the Supreme Court for quite a while. But he said, you know, I wanted to be an engineer when I was young. And I eventually went to law school and became a judge. But I always wondered how my life would have been as an engineer. So if you think that is what you want to do, um, do that. Um, don't worry about it. So I took a leave of absence, I, I, took, I took that job, served three days on that position, uh, and I took a leave of absence for studying, unpaid leave of absence. Eventually, I resigned from that position. I went back to Berkeley and enrolled in a PhD in economics. And I'm very grateful to, 
for, you know, to Robert Cooter for recommending that and believing in my aspiration and recommending me for a PhD in economics. I had no technical background. I was an Italian law student who did a JSD and no technical background. And he got me into a PhD in, um, in economics uh, without even, don't say this to anybody, but without even getting a GRE test. Uh, which is pretty big. Uh, so I'm, you know, grateful to him and grateful to Oliver Williamson for serving as a um, field advisor uh, and to many other people that helped me walk through the field. Um, eventually, I moved to other places. I, I completed my PhD elsewhere uh, because I was teaching at George Mason at the time. Um, so this was an accident, stumbling in the wrong classroom 15 minutes late. There are other accidents that have brought me elsewhere, and I'll mention a few of them. Uh, and one is the Rindberg Castle. Uh, some of you know what it is. Those from Germany. It's a beautiful castle owned by the Max Planck Institute. But one day I get an invitation to go to a conference organized by the Max Planck Institute on the stock market. I had no idea about the stock market, I don't do finance, uh, I don't invest in finance, stock that I invest in real estate, if anything, but I don't buy stocks. And I had to comment on a paper on the transition from floor market to screen market. I didn't even know what the meaning was, but apparently you know, that was the time in which people were doing trading on the screen as opposed to on the floor. Um, and what were the implications of moving from floor market trading to screen market trading, uh, to screen trading. Uh, the invitation was too good to give up. You know, great scholars, great plays, three play, uh, three posts play, uh, play for, and they were publishing the comment. I said, okay, I'll go there. So I educated myself a little bit about this, I tried to come up, come up with something to say. Uh, you know, you're young, you put an effort in things. Uh, all I knew is that I didn't know anything to start with. Uh, I realized there was something wrong there, but I didn't investigate much. Until it was too late. Okay? I was on the stage commenting, and then after the comment, somebody raised a question. Said, Professor Parisi, what you're saying is very interesting, but it contradicts what you wrote a couple of years ago in a paper so and so. So at that point I realized they, inv they invited the wrong person. <laughs> I didn't know that there is no uh, no identity test, I didn't know that. Okay, so I searched, it was a Franco Parisi who is actually an expert on floor trading and skimping. <laughs> I made a lot of friends at that conference, you know, and I'm still friends with them, including Christopher, Christoph Engel, Bruce uh, Schweitzer, and many others. So, another amazing accident that I'm grateful for. Uh, another great accident, uh, I was invited for a faculty workshop at the University of Würzburg. Okay, I show up at the University of Würzburg and go there, the university is closed. And there was a festivity there and there was a beer festival. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? Okay. <laughs> Those who know me, I, you know, the, the, I don't mind that. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, apparently, the, they had left a message at the hotel that I did not get until late evening, um, explaining the mistake. Um, and a young faculty member uh, contacted me at the point 
to invite me for the evening and to walk me through the breweries and distilleries or whatever the and I continue the evening with him. His name is Norbert Schutz. Many of you might know him. Um, he was a, a, a junior professor, now I checked. Uh, he's a chair professor. Um, he was young. Don't, don't record this. He doesn't look so young now, I checked, but he's still there. <laughs> um, we had many beers together. You know, I never met him before, so he asked, you know, what do you work on? And at the time I was still uh, working on my PhD, and I was, you know, discovering something that we later worked on, the competition when competitors work on uh, to produce uh, complementary goods, um, and how competition policy should be re reconsidered when complementary goods are involved. And most antitrust doctrines are tilted on its head uh, when com complements are involved. Uh, this is something that sounded like theoretical stuff that became eventually very important with the Microsoft case. Okay, because when they wanted to split Microsoft into Microsoft, one producing the operating system and one producing applications, and it became clear that splitting Microsoft that way would have made the situation worse because the price would have been even higher than the monopoly price. So I talked to him about this and he was teaching industrial economics and he was, oh, yo, oh, he got really excited. Plus I talked to him about other things, you know, every beer was a topic, every beer was a topic, you know, other the beers, a lot of topics. Um, so eventually, um, I went back home. At the time, I was teaching at George Mason University, George Mason at the time with great students. Uh, I had, um, you know, the privilege of having, you know, what you all know as the Lucius uh, uh, Jonathan Click as my student. Um, Gary the Gis sent me a, a student. Said, "Oh, do you mind have a?" a student who needs to finish his thesis, and that is the Lucius Ben de Porter. And I said, oh, sure, send him, and he lived with me for a year. Um, so these are people that were in my class, and we were talking about ideas. Um, so I was telling them the same stuff I was telling the professor of industrial economics at Würzburg. So one day I checked the email, and I find a, a message from this professor at Würzburg that attaches a file with a model, and it's a model that he wrote about one of the topics I, one of the things, you know, one of the prompts I told him during the beer festival. I said, wow, it was actually a, a well-crafted model. So, Ben the Porter, myself, and Norbert Schultz, Put together and brought a paper, uh, and we published that. And two weeks later, I got another model, Norbert Schultz, and then another model, and then John Click said, "John, help!" And all the papers were clear in my mind, and there were models coming through. And so we ended up publishing four papers. Then Norbert Schultz disappeared. You know, the last two papers he did not even respond to. And then he explained that he had become department chair. Three years later, he responded. I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I became department chair. I lost track of things. Um, I am so happy to see the, paper, the papers published. I actually discovered them because I, I saw the citations. And I, I didn't even know they, had, they got published. So again, an accident, a fortunate accident, a wrong invitation on the wrong day to a uh, faculty workshop during the festivity and too many beers and good things happened. Then I had many rejuvenating encounters. Uh, so up to this point all my work in uh, law economics was based on the standard stuff. Uh, you know, uh, during the formative years the law and economics I knew could have been renamed the theory of incentives. 
malign private and social incentive. If we want people to do what society would like them to do. You know, after all, you know, we see drivers and they slow down when pedestrians cross the street. We cannot distinguish a benevolent driver, altruistic driver that cares about the pedestrian from a selfish driver that fears about liability. You cannot tell who is who. And that's because incentives have been aligned. So when we write models, we do that. Social objective function, private objective function, then we use as instrument, which is the law, to align incentives. That was you know, what, what I had done for many years. Um, it was a very minimal discussion of how do we set up the social objective function. Um, then there were some reju rejuvenating encounters. There was a, a meeting with Guido Calabresi as an Italian. Oh, you must meet Guido Calabresi, come on. Okay, so let's go meet Guido Calabresi. And the Guido Calabresi I knew was, okay, the Guido Calabresi 1970, cause of accidents, Cal Calabresi Melamed, 72 is one of them, you know, it's, it's incentive alignment. Pretty conventional, you know, it's like idea. But the one I met was very different. Okay, he challenged. Uh, he told me, you know, humans care about fairness. Humans care about inequality. But when you write a social objective function, none of that appears. Okay, we want humans to do something that they don't care for. This is before the Caplo and Chavel 1996 two-step optimization, but it was already in the way of thinking that, okay, we cannot do two things at the same time. So I actually defended Kaplan and Chavel, before Kaplan and Chavel actually wrote that, says, eh, we cannot do two things at the same time. You know, fairness is important, but let's maximize the size of the pie first. And then if the pie is not divided fairly, we can re redistribute that with. He says, yeah, but I understood he, he, he understood that. But he was saying something different. He says, you're talking about the instrument. We cannot use the same instrument to do two things. But we are forgetting what humans care for when we are writing the social objective function. We are giving up fairness as an aspirational goal. Okay, one thing is to say we leave it as a second step. But what we are doing is we are, we are ignoring it altogether, even as, as, as an aspirational goal. Wow. Um, that made me think. Okay? Still, it didn't change my way of writing papers, but I cannot challenge. A few years later, um, it was the sixth annual meeting of the American Law and Economics Association. Guido Calabresi was the keynote speaker. Uh, and he told the story of his early career that he was invited uh, in 1965 to the Max Planck Institute, Max Planck is apparently a stepping stone for everybody, uh, of comparative law. Uh, and he, uh, he was writing a paper on what became known as the compatible causation data. And the idea is that we spread losses in case of accidents when both parties are at fault through comparative negligence. But if neither party is negligent, we use an all or nothing allocation of the loss. With strict liability, the Torfiso pays all of it. With negligence, the victim pays all of it. Pays, suffers a loss. But we don't have a way to spread the loss between two non-negligent parties. 
and said, wouldn't it be more fair to spread the accident loss between two parties who are non negligent, just the way we spread the loss between two parties that are negligent? Okay, and apparently he presented this at the Max Planck Institute in 1965, and it was totally shut down. Ironically, in 1625, Hugo Grotius had come up with that idea. You know, if he had cited Hugo Grotius, they would have taken him more seriously. But he didn't cite Hugo Grotius, he didn't know about that. And in 19, sorry, what year was that? In 1996, when Calabresi was a keynote speaker, he lamented the fact that after 30 years, scholars and courts still did not take seriously his idea of 1965 to spread losses between non action parties. So I was sitting there at the dinner table doing a keynote speech with other scholars, and one of them was Robert Coulter, my former teacher. And I asked him, why is it so? Seems pretty good. Seems a pretty good idea. And he responded, you know better. You cannot do fairness and efficiency and creating incentives at the same time. You know, it's a usual couple of little objection. Huh. Um, I went back after the conference with two, with two objections. You know, one is, yeah, we cannot do that, but it sounds fair. Why don't we put that in the social objective function? After all, as an aspirational goal, we should consider that. But second, I, I, I said, when we put all the loss on the torpedoes of restricted liability, Incentives are fine. When we put all the loss, the residual loss on the victim with negligence, incentives work. Why wouldn't they work spreading the loss 50 50 or whatever between the two of them? No? Yeah. So maybe we can actually do it without undermining incentives. So, went back home. And at the time, Giuseppe was around. And I was taking a course at George Washington University with a mathematical economist in Siphon. <laughs> and so I asked the two of them, you know, can you help me figure out whether my intuition that incentives are not undermined when you spread the loss between non-negative parties is correct. So we started working together. It was a three scholars team. Uh, I check my old folders, I keep all the old files on my hard drive. And up to version 162 of the paper, Giuseppe appears as a co-author. Okay? And then at that point he withdrew, said I'm out. <laughs> I think he, he did the right thing. I think he would still be a graduate student at Utrecht <laughs> if he stayed on the, on the team. <laughs> Eventually, version 534 of the paper got published in the American Economics Review um, in 2004. Okay. Uh, eight years. Um, and even in that version, we could not generate a general proof that incentives are not incentives to take care are not undermined if the loss is spread between non-agent parties. But we could also not generate any counter example in which we could we could show that there are value. Okay, it was enough to get published. 
we published, said, let's go. So I was invited that year in India to present paper. I presented that paper. I confess that this is a strong paper, but not a really strong paper because I, we don't have a general proof. Um, and after after how many years? After six years, I got an email from an Indian professor who was at the time um, a PhD student at the Daly School of Economics. And he said, oh, you probably don't remember me. I was in the audience when he presented a paper. And he told me, he told us, that there was no general proof of your claim. And I was puzzled, so I've been working on that. I think I found the general proof. So he sent the general proof. We actually published the general proof as, as a follow-up. So the thing is that we can always spread the loss between victim and tortfeasor who are not negligent, just the way we do it with comparative negligence, sort of comparative non-negligence, without undermining care incentives. We can do fairness under tort law. Wow. So the question then is when do we want to do that? that we can do it is good, but when do we want to do that? And so we worked with Alice Guerra and Emanuela Carbonara to see what are the conditions under which we want to do that. And so in 2016, we wrote a paper that was published in Journal of Legal Studies to identify the, the situations in which it is preferable to spread the loss, situations in which the all or nothing traditional rules are preferable. Remaining young. So, during the last years, all my work has involved students. Um, former students or current students. Um, checking, I think, my, the average age of the, of the team stayed constant. So as I progress, I think I will have to recruit co-authors in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> or at least increase the size of the co-authorship team to keep the average low. Uh, so these collaborations in many ways help me stay young also in my thinking in the, in the research. Um, before, You know, when, I, when I finished the course in tort theory and policy, the book on tort law by Landis and Posner had just been published. The book on tort law by Chavel had just been published. Same, I think they're both Harvard University Press, same year, almost simultaneously. It felt like that area of law is saturated, there is no more to be done, and papers were getting narrower, more specific, and less interesting. And so that was either one way you get more technical and narrower, or you venture into new fields. So if you look at my CV, you know, you see that I started going into public international law, conflict of laws, formation of social norms and customary law, European, European Union law, biblical law, judge-made law and legal evolution, rent-seeking litigation, comparative law and economics, political cost you name it. I went all over the place, okay, because I was looking for low-hanging fruits. But then my students came back, and with them I went back to the traditional topics with a freshness of look. They were looking at things with a fresh eye. I remember Daniel Pye, some of you know him, you know, he was a student of mine in Minnesota. He, did, he just finished a PhD in the Edward program. Okay, and I was teaching the tort law, saying, okay, tort precautions, victims' precautions, and he stopped me right there and says, 
Professor, what are you talking about? You know, when I go out in the morning, I'm just careful. I just try to stay out of trouble. And when my mom was worrying about me, she would tell me, be careful. That's how we take precautions. No, we don't know if there is an accident, whether we are going to be victims or torfeasors. We take precautions, period. Okay, there, most precautions have a bilateral effect, they have a dual effect. So which liability rules will incentivize the taking of this bilateral dual effect precautions? Well, it turns out, no, all liability rules do create incentives to take those precautions, and those are the precautions we want to incentivize. Those are the precautions the mom wants us to take when we go out. Those are the precautions that the social planner wants people to take, should want people to take. The model misses all of that. And Alice Guerra, you know, we think about the symmetry of victims and torfeasors and the tort law. Do they really work symmetrically? And we did an experiment, they don't work symmetrically. Financial incentives may be the same, but they don't work symmetrically. So what do we do about that? And with Ariel Borat and Maria Bigoni and Stefania Bortolotti, we went back you know, to something that you know, brought back to the Calabresi fundamental questions. Um, Richard Porter says that efficient breach is efficient breach. It doesn't matter why there is a breach. Whether people breach to pursue a gain or whether people breach to avoid a loss. If there is a surplus to pursue, we should allow for that. As long as they're willing to compensate the breachee, let the breachor do what he wants. But is what humans really want? And so we tested that hypothesis. People don't want that. People are totally okay with breachors breaching if they're trying to avoid a loss. People are not okay with breachors breaching when they're trying to pursue a gain. Even though they're getting compensated and even overcompensated, they are not okay for that. So the question is, should the law conform to human preferences rather than social objective functions that omit to include those human preferences? Omit to include those important components of human instincts. We're not going to answer this question because hopefully there will be some food coming. <laughs> so browsing through the panels today, through, through the program today, I noticed one thing is that unlike past years, in the past years you will see the titles of the panels going all over the place. They were looking for low-hanging fruits in esoteric fields. Okay, the panels this year were back to normal, towards crime. But the papers were interesting, bringing new methodological insights. Like my students are bringing new methodological insights to standard stuff. I should thank one person that has contributed not only to my papers, but has allowed me to accept the title of being a prolific scholar. Okay, a scholar I was before, but prolific after that I had to accept. Um, she um, gave birth to the fifth and sixth daughters and that's uh, um, Barbara Lupi. Um, she's a wonderful woman, uh, a great mom, and a 
brilliant scholar, as you all know. I'm sorry, she's not here. Uh, I have to say that many, my, my academic life, as you have heard, has progressed through many mistakes, fortunate accidents. I believe that the award I'm receiving is another mistake, <laughs> but it's well accepted. Um, European scholars have played an immense role, as you have heard as well. So I'm particularly honored that this award comes from the European Association of Economics. Thank you. <laughs>